Um, well, hello, uh, hello, lovely people, uh, and thank you very much for the intro uh, introduction, Simon. Um, thank you for sharing my post as well. Um, it's something that's really important to me uh, as uh, an introvert to um, to mention that it's okay if you don't say anything, but thank you if you choose to. Uh, and similarly with uh, the chat and videos and all the rest, it's fine if you don't want to, but thank you if you do. Um, so it's great to be here. I am, uh, I'm Kerry. Hi. Um, so at this point, most people would list all their accolades. Um, but don't worry, I'm here to reassure you that I am hot. Uh, so I studied law and then English literature and then psychology. But I also contracted meningitis twice and encephalitis once. Um, I am currently studying to be a neuroscientist, but that will sit alongside other letters that I have um, after my name. Uh, for example, uh, ADHD, uh, OCD, PTSD, FND, all the fun. Uh, luckily for me, I'm an agile behavioral coach. So my work focuses on individuals and their interactions. And essentially by helping myself, I also help other hot messes become slightly less messy. Um, so I've been using Agile ways of working for just under a decade. Um, I'm really passionate about what I do, even though I still have crippling anxiety about doing it. Whether it's imposter phenomenon or Dunning-Kruger syndrome, I'm not sure yet. Only time will tell. Um, but, we, you know, we, we learn to work with what we have, right? So this evening, hello, uh, this evening, let's look at what we have. So to begin with, we're going to talk about uh, stress uh, and anxiety and overwhelm. And we'll look at how that leads to burnout and quite without meaning to, uh, how that can make conflict worse. We're not talking about healthy disagreement here. We're talking about all out door slamming, stomp offing, Zoom call quitting conflict, uh, and no one wants that. So this evening, first of all, we're going to go right back to the beginning. We're going to look at where our responses came from. Next, we're going to look at how pand uh, the, the pandemic, or, or in fact any stress event, um, divorce, bereavement, any kind of uh, home or workplace drama, makes these things harder to deal with not just for us, but also for our colleagues, for our teams, uh, for everyone in, within our business. And finally, we're going to look at what we can do going forwards. So to begin with, I'd like to invite you to close your eyes for a moment. And I want you to take a moment and imagine that you're in a dark forest. You're alone. Actually, you're lost. And all around you is silence. And as you stand there, not knowing where you are or where to go, behind you, a twig snaps. Now, a moment later, your friends come through the bushes with torches. You are found. You're safe. OK, please open your eyes. So just using the reactions button, uh, which I'll give you a moment to find, I'd be really interested to know um, uh, if you noticed a change in your physiology uh, between when you were lost versus when you were safe. If you had a reaction to that twig snapping, if you had a reaction to realising that it was your friends uh, in that moment. And it's okay if you didn't. I see a few people did, that was delightful. <laughs> okay, thank you. So we have just under 100 billion neurons uh, in our brains, each one of which has around 30,000 connections. And we imagine with all of this brain that we therefore think rational thought. 
But in those threat situations, we still react as if that threat is real, whether it's an imagined one or a real one. Our brain can't tell the difference. And actually, when the studies have been done using uh, MRI scanners, they found that visualizations trigger activity in exactly the same areas of the brain, uh, for example, in your visual or your motor cortex, um, as the actual physical experience would itself. Um, so for those of you who had a reaction there, um, perhaps you noticed an increase in your heart rate. Perhaps you became suddenly more aware in that moment. And if you are somebody who is um, maybe slightly anxious or perhaps somebody who's more imaginative or creative, then you might have noticed a stronger reaction or a really visceral uh, strong reaction. So why is that? Well, to answer that question, we need to go and look at some of the earliest uh, organisms. Here you can see uh, there's some amphioxi. Um, they were around about 100 million years ago, and they're still around today. So the amphioxus was um, a simple aquatic worm-like creature that would anchor itself to the ground and sit there and wait for food to drift into its mouth. It was such a simple creature that it didn't have um, a brain so much as a control centre that would respond to perceived threats. So if there was a shadow that passed over it, it would sense that shadow um, and it would dart away from the shadow to somewhere where the shadow was not. Now, as these really ancient simple creatures became more complex, they uh, evolved more complex ways of catching food and evading threat. The control centre also had to become more complex, but those core functions remained. They stayed throughout. So as we um, learned better threat responses, um, as, as those ancient creatures learned better threat responses, they were the ones then that were more likely to survive. And they tended to pass on those reflexes to their offspring. So those inherited traits were passed on down the generations and as the, the creatures evolved. So these traits then, these responses, they're primal, not prim primitive, and certainly not reptilian. Um, no matter what you might hear some people say. <clears throat> and just on that note, um, a more effective model of the brain than the reptilian um, mammalian brain thing that goes around, it comes from Dr. Dan Siegel and he calls it the brain in the hand. So I'll show you that. Um, so it involves um, closing your fingers over your thumb like this. Um, so this part of your hand becomes uh, the, the heel of your hand here. This is your brain stem. This is the part of your brain that's responsible for your breathing, your digestion, your heart rate, those basic functions there. Your fingers here, they become uh, the cortex and these two in the middle um, effectively represent your prefrontal cortex. This is the bit that um, takes the majority of the, the um, the work for your um, your executive function, um, for example, decision making, problem solving, creativity, that sort of thing. So your, your palm then, that represents your limbic system. And this is a part of the brain that's strongly associated with um, your emotions, uh, also your motivation and your fight or flight response. So this is you in a rational state when you are relatively calm. But sometimes you might, uh, as Dan Siegel says, you might flip your lid or lose it, lose control. Now you've got your thumb here and this uh, knuckle uh, represents your amygdala. This is a part of the brain that's uh, generally associated with your emotions, um, in particular with fear, anger, aggression and anxiety. And these are the responses that are triggered, particularly when we are stressed. 
And your amygdala does this using the significance. Um, it judges the significance of events using your your emotional memory. So your previous ex, um, experiences that have um, attached emotions, and that includes those inherited traits. So your amygdala essentially predicts what it thinks might be an appropriate response for that situation, purely based on what it picks up from the context. Essentially, these are vaguely educated guesses. Now, the important thing to note here is that when you have flipped your lid, those responses bypass your cortex. You can think of your cortex as almost detached from the process. So this is the bit of your brain responsible for your rational thought, your decision making, your problem solving. But actually what's in control is that stress response, that fear response. And it's got a direct connection to your motor cortex, which is actually on the back. And this is why we feel the need to move rather than uh, or to, to respond aggressively rather than to think rationally and calmly in those situations. So what we're doing then is triggering a massive response, a chemical response uh, in the sympathetic nervous system. And we release a number of neurochemicals, neurotransmitters, um, amongst them adrenaline, norepinephrine, acetylcholine and cortisol. So let's have a look at those using the medium of jelly sweets. Um, so we begin with adrenaline. Adrenaline is one of the first things we feel um, and, and notice. It's a hormone um, and it, it gives us the urge to move. And this is essentially to make us um, escape the threat. Next, we have cortisol, and this has the effect of suppressing. So it suppresses our immune system, our digestion, our libido. It suppresses our ability to grow or to repair our bodies. And actually, too much of it can lead to something called hypercortisolism, uh, which is where the system becomes burned out. We can no longer suppress those, uh, those actions, and we get a hyper response instead. So that can show up as um, allergies or overeating sex addiction or um, over replication of cells including mutating cells and so on so there's been some recent studies showing that um, cancer quite often often follows uh, within a few years of a significant or traumatic life events so if you're going to check for lumps definitely be doing that now so next we have the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, and this gives us a sense of urgency. Now, if you've ever been in a rush to catch a train or a plane, um, and especially now that we've all forgotten how to even catch a train, um, this is the feeling that you get when you're rushing to get somewhere. Now, again, I guess a, a more appropriate uh, example might be, um, for those of you uh, still working from home, uh, the rush to mute Zoom and run down to the front door before the postman leaves. God love him. So <clears throat> next we have the neurotransmitter norepinephrine, and this gives us a sense of alertness. So for those of you who had the response earlier to the twig snapping, the feeling that you got there, that was norepinephrine. Um, if you have an alarm that wakes you up in the morning and you actually respond to that alarm, then your response to the alarm going off. Or if you're someone with kids or pets and you are working and it all suddenly goes quiet, that's the same feeling there. Or perhaps you hear a smash and then silence following that. So the key takeaway, the thing that I want to make you particularly aware of right now, is that this is an involuntary neurobiological response. It happens on a subconscious level. And the reason for this is because it's quite energy uh, it's more energy efficient to do it that way. Um, co conscious thought is um, very expensive in terms of brain energy. Um, and just to give you a picture um, or help you build a, a picture of, um, uh, we'll get, a, get some perspective, an idea of the scale of, the sub of your subconscious. If you were to draw, um, if you had a piece of paper to hand, and for those of you who do, do try, uh, try this out. A piece of paper, on that piece of paper, draw a circle for how big you think um, would represent your conscious, uh, your conscious self. Now I'm not here to shame anyone, so I won't ask you to hold your circle up to the camera, but just for your own uh, curiosity, draw that circle and see what you end up with. <clears throat> You're welcome to hold it up if you want to, but you don't have to. All right, not to leave you waiting, 
The answer is, if you had an A4 piece of paper and you took a Sharpie pen and you drew a dot, that dot would represent your conscious self, your thinking, rational, I am me awareness. And all of the rest is the subconscious activity of your brain ticking along without you noticing. Now, obviously that includes things like heart function and breathing and organs, but it also includes our responses, that subconscious stress response that bypasses the cortex. What we're trying to show here is that this behavior is wholly reflexive, not intentional. Now, we could say that this is a simple case of uh, stimulus and response, but we are complex beings, so it's so much more than that. We have to include state. State is our intervening variable. Um, and your state might be something so simple as um, the physical, so being tired or being hungry. It might be on an emotional level, maybe your response to being in the midst of a pandemic, maybe the thought of being back in the office for people for the first time in months, or maybe your response to then being told to stay home again. Now one intervening state is stress, and stress is a reciprocal physiological response. That means that the state you are in affects your response, your response then in turn affects your state, your state then again affects your response. Um, it's, uh, well stress is kind of nuts, right? So let's look at a moment at stress. So we might believe that our situation is not uh, something new, something previously, uh, something that we haven't experienced. We might also think that uh, or believe that the outcome is uncertain. We might then think that the outcome might be harmful or in some way challenges our well-being and we might think that it's something we can't overcome. And finally, we might think that we have limited or no power to change the outcome. Now, this process is both chemical and interpretative. So we, with the help of our amygdala, essentially decide in the moment how to respond. Um, and you might have experienced this if you've ever been in a situation like an appraisal or an awkward retrospective. We might have experienced this when having to give someone feedback or if you take on uh, a public speaking engagement perhaps, and we respond as if we're faced with a saber-toothed tiger or, you know, zombies. So another intervening state might be uh, or is anxiety, and this is where we have an acute awareness of risk. Now, this response is great for helping us to get through simple tasks, especially physical ones where we have to move or run or lift or throw. And it means that when I'm in a panic or in a crisis, I do really well at panic cleaning. Very handy sometimes. But it's not so great for complex tasks. Um, so because our brain in this situation is focusing on our physical well-being, our energy is diverted or our blood flow is diverted away from the cortex and it can become a constant battle, um, especially because for a lot of people, things are really hard right now. We're trying to think through problems when we have less oxygen in our pre prefrontal cortexes to actually feed it, to let us think through those problems. It's like trying to think through a wall. And for some of, it, some of us, it can send us into blind panic. Essentially it's you know, where we visualize things going wrong and we trigger that, uh, that state response, state response um, result. So in that situation, we become hyper aware. This is the result of norepinephrine, which was the, uh, the neurotransmitter that gives us more awareness. And we end up with a sense of overwhelm, not fight, not flight, but we move into the freeze state of being. Essentially, we don't think that we can overcome the threat. Things have gone so far outside of our control that there's just no point. And this response is supposed to, well, all of these responses really, they're supposed to serve us for seconds or minutes in order to help us escape or evade danger. But in our uh, modern lives, these responses are going on for days, for weeks, 
for months. And that was the case even before the pandemic. Now, the emotional effort of all of this takes its toll and quite often it leads to burnout. This is where we are emotionally, mentally, physically exhausted. Burnout is where the reward no longer offsets uh, the effort. And the worrying thing about this is that it has a scarring uh, and an aging effect on the areas of our brains that regulate and process our emotions. So when we're suffering with burnout, we have less control over our emotional responses. We're more likely to startle at tiny triggers. We have less creativity. We're less able to solve problems. It also affects our memory and it affects our attention. What we essentially have is a burned stress response system. And that makes it difficult to get a sense of urgency or motivation for anything. So a quick experiment, how's her mood? I'm going to invite you on your device to take a look at menti.com. I can see who doesn't love a menti poll. Um, Simon has nicely warmed you up for me here. Thank you, Simon. Uh, and when you get to Menti, uh, I'd like you to enter the code 19082212. If you wouldn't mind giving me just a brief wave when you're when you're there. Fabulous, thank you. Thank you. So how is her mood? your horrible insight into my tabs. Excellent. So that's really interesting. So it's quite normal to get a majority response for neutral or calm, um, but actually it's not at all surprising to get some people voting for negative, um, anxious, fearful, or unhappy, or sad, or angry. Um, and I'm delighted that somebody voted that she looks positive or happy or kind. Fabulous. That's great. Um, so, we use our interpretation of vocal tone, of facial expressions, um, body language, to show us how safe we are with people. Um, so I'm just going to go back. Do, 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 do. Let's go back here. Um, so this, these, these, um, these, these pieces of information show us how safe we are with people. And what's interesting is we usually get it wrong. The reason for this is because there is no one face for each emotion. So the brain, our brain guesses how the other person is feeling based on context. Um, and this is one of the big causes of Zoom fatigue because it's exhausting when there are no physical context clues. We can see people's faces, but we can't judge people's emotion from their faces alone. We need the whole body and their posture um, and their, their tone to help us to work out how they're feeling. Now, the interesting thing about uh, people who are experiencing more burnout is that they tend to have a more negative interpretation of any kind of facial response uh, or any kind of um, facial features. So if the face is slightly happy, then somebody suffering from more burnout would see that face as neutral. If the face that you're presented with is neutral, you might see that face as um, you know, shades of uh, unhappiness or even anger um, and feel threatened by that. So for anyone who thought she was angry, again, you don't have to answer this out loud, but are you stressed? 
it might be time to take things a bit easier in, uh, in any way that you can. And the reason for saying this and that there's no wrong answer is because she's actually metahuman. She's completely AI generated. But what's interesting is that we still interpret what we see. So when we end up in this situation and we have online calls, we have even less context to work with. And this is what then leads to a significant increase in workplace drama. So this study was run before the pandemic and before the pandemic, uh, Cy Wakeman of uh, Reality Based Leadership found that we spend around two and a half hours every day involved in workplace drama. That's each one of us. This could take the form of blaming and shaming or judging, uh, venting. Uh, it's uh, situations where you're feeling frustration or resentment or anger. It's when you get sucked into um, politics or when you feel the need to sabotage projects. It's when you get drawn into um, dealing with someone's ego or you're dealing with people, uh, or there's one upmanship. Um, it's situations where people are arguing about accountability or refusing to take responsibility. Um, now, the dark triad aside, underneath everything, we want to generally believe that we are good people. Um, the thinking goes, um, if I am a good person, if I am a good parent, a good employee, a good friend, that means that I will be then validated and accepted. It means I'm more likely to, to be kept safe, I'm more likely to stay alive. And this harks back to the formation of the brain that we were talking about earlier. Our ancient ancestors were more likely to survive in social groups and the more socialized amongst them tended to be the ones who survived. That means that we take even very tiny signs of rejection very seriously, especially when we are burned out or already under threat. This then leads to drama. Um, and one of the ways that that shows up is with othering. This is where we create a sense of us versus them. We're dealing with in-group versus out-group. And the problem with othering is that it shuts down our ability to feel compassion for the other person. For anybody who's ever been cut up by somebody else whilst they're out driving, it's very easy, easy to uh, feel a complete lack of compassion for that other person. We, in that situation, we dehumanize them. We feel contempt. And, um, you know, in the office, this comes across as a tut or eye rolling. So we see other people in that situation questioning our ideas or even giving us feedback as some sort of criticism of ourselves. This criticism means that I am somehow now not a good person. And we respond um, in a way that protects ourselves. We respond with denial or indignation. We respond with deflection or blame or uh, finger pointing or with shame. And what happens is that both people then get a sense of rejection. Both people in the conversation then feel unsafe. So when we are going through um, stages of criticism, um, when we're experiencing criticism or giving criticism, we see ourselves and the other person very differently. So when we look at our own mistakes, we, we find it very easy to attribute them to circumstance. That's just the way it happened. Uh, I make mistakes because of what happened to me. Whereas when we're looking at other people's mistakes, we find it much easier to attribute them to a character flaw. So you make mistakes because of who you are. And again, this is a subconscious response. These are snap judgments. And without uh, noticing it, we all tend to do this. So let's take a moment to recap. So we've looked at the brain in the hand um, and how we're not able to access rational thought when we flip our lid. We've looked at how the body has an involuntary chemical response to stress and how it changes our behaviour. We've looked at stress, anxiety and overwhelm. We've also look, looked at burnout, how we reach those states and how they can affect our ability to regulate our emotions. We've looked at how we interpret facial expression more negatively under stress. 
and we've looked at how we frame things as us and them, uh, how we uh, show contempt and that leads to dehumanizing and lets us treat others as culpable. So what can we take from all of this? Well, we can take that state, our state affects how we see everything and our response. But one thing I want to convey is that we remain neuroplastic until we are dead or undead. Um, and our brain is shaped by every event and interaction, even this session this evening which means that at any stage, at any moment, no matter how bad, bad things have been up until this point, we can change, we can do better. So take a moment and notice your mood. How are you feeling? How calm are you? How pleasant or not is this experience right now? And then we can look at how we can respond to that rush of chemicals when we experience them. So if you're experiencing adrenaline, um, a great way to deal with that is to move. It's giving you a sense of urgency. Run up and down the stairs, wave your arms around for a few minutes, get some blood pumping, tell your body that you are responding to the, st the state of uh, threat that you, uh, your, your amygdala believes that you're experiencing. Um, essentially, we're giving, uh, giving your body cues that you're responding to the threat. Um, yeah, so run, jump, wave your arms, um, jiggle your legs on the spot for a minute, anything for 30 seconds um, or a minute if you can. In terms of cortisol, this is the, um, the, the um, hormone that suppresses uh, from earlier. So cortisol tends to flood our system uh, and the flood lasts for about 90 seconds. So a really good uh, way to respond to this is to distract yourself for a moment with a short breathing exercise. Um, some really effective breathing exercises is where you breathe in, in, and then a longer exhale. So. <laughs> And interestingly, this replicates the kind of breathing that we use when we're laughing, when we're crying, and when we're singing, all ways that we use to self-soothe. Now, in terms of the sense of urgency, it's a great idea to respond to that by doing something. Um, so you can, for example, uh, in, in that state of emergency, you can identify three next steps that you can take, or if that is too much, than just the next right thing. Uh, that was a Frozen 2 reference for anyone who's seen it, you're welcome. Um, okay, so in terms of norepinephrine, this is the neurotransmitter that gives us the uh, sense of alertness. So in that moment, it can help to notice the reality of the situation. Notice the things around you. Um, ask yourself, what do I know for sure? What am I assuming? What story am I telling myself and what am I allowing myself to believe? We can also um, introduce an element of practical pessimism, or I like to call this practical pessimism. So this is where we notice the situation that we're in and we choose to accept it as where we are. Everything that's happened up until this point can't be changed. So all that's left is where we are in this moment. We can stop fighting where we are in this moment, and instead we can make a choice. We can decide what to do next. Or perhaps you might want to frame it as realistic optimism. That's where we retain our hope for things getting better in the future, but we plan for obstacles. We use what's real, what's here, what's now, instead of what's a fantasy state of being or the ideal state of being. There's no guarantee that we'll achieve that, so we can use what's what's real instead. And we must do this because we want stability, but disruption and change are normal. Uh, that's Cthulhu for anybody who's not familiar. Um, what we end up with is a biopsychosocial problem. We have a physical response to an environmental trigger, and then we have a psychological interpretation. But this is also affected by how connected we feel. So recent studies have shown that your relationships stimulate learning and growth. To, so to support this, we can go from self-regulation to co-regulation. How do we move to co-regulation, I hear you ask? It's simple. We use cues. <laughs> You're welcome. 
um, cues, uh, indicators that show you and the people around you that you're safe. Things that tell people around you, I've got your back, and they in turn, turn can show you, you've got mine. Essentially, we want to show people you care because they have value and you can let yourself believe that they, that they care because you have value. We can also do things like showing gratitude, showing genuine appreciation for the small things that people do to help, help us throughout their day. That's a reciprocal, a reciprocally beneficial action that you can take. You can pay it forward, be generous without resentment, both with your, uh, your, your time, your attention, your help when you're asked, if you can. And instead of gossip, we can practice pro-social behaviours instead. So instead of talking about people behind their backs, compliment them behind their backs. It feels good. And when it gets back to that person, it feels great for them as well. We can also celebrate tacos. Who doesn't love? tacos. Um, that is tiny accomplishments and successes. Tacos. That is Parry Grip's Taco Cat. Anyone with kids who hasn't heard of Parry Grip, indulge yourself. Um, okay, so I want you to try something. Um, uh, this is where we open up breakout rooms. Don't panic. You don't have to join a breakout room if you're not comfortable joining a breakout room. Just don't click the button that says join. But for everybody who's willing and game, do please click on the join at breakout rooms. I'm going to put to you, well, actually, Farah or Simon are going to very kindly put to you, thank you, Farah, uh, in pairs. And in your pairs, for one minute each, I want you to very briefly introduce yourself. Now, I believe the breakout room is set up so that after one minute, a notification will pop up and invite you to rejoin this room. Don't click that. Stay where you are. That's your indicator to swap places and introduce, uh, let the other person introduce themselves. And then the breakout meetings will automatically close at the end of two minutes and you will all be brought back here. For anybody who wants to stay here, you're welcome to do that. Um, you don't have to switch your microphone on or your video. You can just stay and sit and enjoy the silence. OK, thank you. Oh, thank you so much, everybody, and, uh, and welcome back. Thank you so much for participating in that. Uh, I appreciate it. So I imagine that was a completely different experience that time, right? Uh, I'm hoping I'm hoping it was anyway. Um, excellent. I'm really glad to hear that. That's fabulous news. Wonderful. When we share uh, real information, not just, um, you know, trying to make that initial superficial connection, we stimulate uh, a lot more of our social needs. In fact, there was an experiment uh, that was run with strangers asking 36 questions with increasing depth. Um, and they began with questions like, given the choice of anyone in the world, who would you want as a dinner guest? And would you like to be famous? And in what way? And then they ended with questions like share with your partner an embarrassing moment in your life. And when did you last cry in front of another person or by yourself? Tell your partner something that you like about them already. Or if you were to die this evening with no opportunity to communicate with anyone, with anyone, what would you most regret not having told someone? And why haven't you told them yet? Now, sometimes before going into these sorts of situations, we need a little anonymity first. So an extended exercise that I encourage teams to try um, is the one, uh, well, I'll show you in a moment, but I use it because it shows cues. It shows these cues. It helps to encourage feelings of safety. <clears throat> and it, it gives us an opportunity to support and an opportunity to also show each other gratitude. So thinking about the last exercise, and I won't ask you to, um, I won't ask you to, to um, spend a lot of time in this, but think of a few things that are worrying you, uh, one or two things or three or four if you have more. So a few things that are currently worrying you. And next, and what I encourage my teams to try, 
um, is to add those concerns or worries to one of three columns on a shared wall. So we do this in terms of work concerns, things that we're working through at the moment, um, things that we're struggling with. Particularly, this is effective in teams where there's limited psychological safety. Perhaps they don't feel safe asking for help with questions or things that they're struggling with. The three columns are things that I can change, thing that I, things that I can change with help, and things that I can't change. So today we're going to be focusing on the middle column, things that I can change, but with help. So of the things that are worrying you right now, choose those worries, things that I can change with help. So in the, uh, with those worries, we then ask ourselves, who can help me with this? How can they help me with this? When might they be able to help me with this? Um, and as I say, I run this, uh, run this with uh, two different teams where there was relatively low psychological safety. Um, so they had a daily stand up or a daily scrum with a micromanaging uh, area manager. So we created this as an anonymous wall. And we call it, or I call it the worry wall. People would add what they needed help with, and then someone else would add their name if they were able to help with that task. They were then able to, uh, the person who wrote the worry initially was able to go to the person who offered their help and they could talk away from public gaze. They didn't have to publicly admit that they needed help with things when it wasn't safe to do so. It also helped to make visible just how much everyone was dealing with. So when those same micromanaging um, uh, area manager, that same manager was coming along and asking why things hadn't been done, they could see a very visual uh, representation of all of the things that those uh, people on that team were carrying. This also helps to give us the idea that we're not alone in our struggle. When we've tried this um, with more general worries, common themes come up um, and that can be really, uh, it can feel really supporting to know that it's not just you, um, whereas before you thought that it probably was. Okay, so another thing that we can do is instead of the poop sandwich method of feedback, which really doesn't work, by the way, we can do what I like to call kintsugi feedback. So this is where we look at the behaviour or the action that you like in the other person and something that we want to see more of. And we bring that behaviour or that action to that individual and we talk to them about it helps, uh, how it helps the team goals or the company goals, how it fits in with the values. And then together you have a conversation focusing on how to put things back together, but better. The idea here being that you feed what you want to grow and stay neutral to the rest. So there we go. Here's the three columns. Um, here's things that people have put on the three columns. Um, there we go. I'll just click through those. All right. So, and there's the poop sandwich, just because it's worth taking a moment um, to appreciate the poop sandwich. Um, so, Kintsugi feedback. Feed what you want to grow and stay neutral to the rest. Another thing that we can do is to act as a vulnerable, honest coach. So using that, um, uh, we could ask questions, open questions of people um, without accusation, asking them how, what, where, when, who, and why. We can also be more open with them as we go into those conversations. So we can say to them um, as we begin the conversation, I'm feeling really nervous about having this conversation with you, or I've been feeling really anxious um, about bringing this up with you. Um, you can also talk about uh, your own need for, um, or your own needs. So um, your need for safety, your need for certainty, and how well that's being met and what can be done to help that be met more effectively. This is something that Marshall Goldsmith suggests in his book, Nonviolent Communication. And if you come across someone um, who feels less safe, perhaps there's somebody who um, tends to take more of a mocking uh, approach to these sorts of things, well, perhaps they feel unsafe. Their idea of whether or not they're a good person feels threatened. And you can use tools like the worry wall with them and use coaching questions, um, open coaching questions, how, what, where, when, who and why. 
be the person to lead the way or leave. It's important to always put your own gas mask on first, right? What we want to also move towards is uh, where we're showing empathy, not sympathy. So sympathy is where my bias meets yours. You believe that you're the victim um, and I agree that you can't do hard things, but we don't want to be in that position. Instead, we want to show empathy. So when they bring their problems to us, we say that sounds really hard. What are you gonna do about it? We can also help them to reframe from the ideal to the real. Now we are unlikely to ever trust each other 100%. But when we look at our culture, we can move ourselves collectively towards a position where we're able to experience more growth, a safer environment where we're perhaps slightly less suspicious of each other. And especially knowing about our own inherited responses to perceived threat, we can also take a stance of becoming more suspicious of our own certainty in any situation. And then we are able to move from self-regulation to co-regulation. We need connection. We only get through these things together. And as the marvellous and inimitable St. Dave Snowden said, every corpse on Everest was an extremely motivated person. Without a support system, the individual will fail. So we've looked at our brains and what goes on neurochemically. We've looked at how we sometimes react and what we're aiming for when we do. We've, we've seen that it's not our reactions that are bad. It's all about how we view the world. We looked at some things that help, and we took a moment to look at some things that don't. We've seen that this is not a simple one-sided issue. It is a biopsychosocial problem, and that means it needs a biopsychosocial response. Now, perhaps I've confirmed what you already knew, and that's fine, but common sense does not mean action. Simple does not mean easy. But crucially, hard does not mean impossible. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Kerry. You're very welcome. Oh, marvellous. This evening's presentation has been brought to you by the words norepinephrine, acetylcholine, cortisol, and adrenaline. And yes, I did have to write those words down before I said that was fantastic. That was really what an amazing, what an amazing amount of uh, information to share. And I agree with Villa in the chat that you know A plus absolutely for the uh, slides. Absolutely outstanding stuff. Right. Um, does anybody have any questions? And whilst you're thinking about whether you have any questions, I've just got a final uh, screen to share. Actually, oh. <laughs> um, if I can do that, um, which is just uh, this one. Do, do, do. Um, if anybody wants to do any further reading, um, I highly recommend this pile of books, which is not very helpful, I appreciate. Um, I would start with emotional agility. Um, that's a great place to begin uh, and crucial conversations or nonviolent communication. Um, from there, I would go on to any one of the rest that feels achievable in the time that you have. And now I will stop sharing. Do feel free to screenshot that. Um, and also I'm quite happy to share the slides afterwards uh, if you want to, to write those down. Okay, there you go, have the screen back. Sorry, Simon. No problem. I screenshot that by the way, people. So if you're in our Slack group, I'll share Kerry's book stack in the Slack and you can check that out. Right. I would very much welcome any questions. Yeah, that emotional agility book, I think it's eye opening and it's a really accessible, really easy book to read. Um, and yeah, how emotions are made is, uh, yeah, Lisa Feldman Barrett, and she's just brought out a new book, um, actually, or well, fairly recently, which is this one. It's Seven and a Half Lessons About the Brain, which is, uh, if you already like her work, is uh, another excellent read. Liz, I think you had a question. Yeah, um, I do. Um, thanks. Thanks, Kerry. It was a really fantastic 
talk um and yeah really great and uh, so I, I really you know so I'm obviously already familiar with the kind of you know the fight flight and it was really good to go into detail about the different um hormones and how they and how there's a different response like a good so for example if you get an adrenaline feeling go and run up and down the stairs mm -hmm. but as I was thinking it through I was thinking how am I going to know which one I'm feeling at that time because they all kind of overlap or they come together mm -hmm. and like is this a run up the stairs situation or is this a write down three ideas situation or, or maybe I just need to do all of them but I wondered whether and and I also realized that maybe this question means I probably wasn't paying enough attention because you might already have told us that <laughs> Not, <laughs> but if you wouldn't mind going over it again <laughs> yeah of course so it is a flood of chemicals it's uh, you know it's it's all of them at once um, so, yeah, I, I would say start with whatever feels most achievable in the moment. So if running up and down the stairs feels like that might serve you best in the moment, do that first and then come back and then write down some things that might help you. Um, if you um, can't face running anywhere, you're just rooted to the spot, then write down the thing that, um, that seems like it would help you. Uh, and that thing that you write down may well be go and run up and down the stairs <laughs> and then the thing that you write down after that maybe wave your hands around or you know um uh, don't yell into a cushion there's actually quite a lot of research saying that that's not very helpful um but uh, yeah running up and down the stairs might be uh, one thing on the list and waving your hands or, or you know finding a blog or whatever you want to do next go and you know talk quietly to somebody um not yelling yelling doesn't help yelling just exacerbates stress Thank you. Thank you. I think I think for me that the big takeaway was if your brain is for trying to get you to do something, yeah. then you should do it to tell your brain it's done rather than letting those hormones kind of like hang around. Yes, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Because one of the things that doing, I mean, especially the physical activity, and it doesn't have to be running up and down the stairs, it can be. Um, you know, something that you do sat at your desk, you know, you can, you can wave your arms around for a few minutes and turn off your video screen first or people think you're nuts. Um, but, um, you know, one of the things that you're then doing is increasing blood flow throughout your body, which means that you're then, you know, you're cycling through, you're getting oxygen to your brain, you're incre increasing your ability to regain control of your prefrontal cortex and actually think your way through the problem. So, yeah, all, all of the things in the order that fits. Thank you. Patricia, Patricia. Uh, yeah, uh, fantastic talk. Thank you very much. It's very, very insightful. And um, I would like to, uh, I'm very interested in inclusion. And one thing that uh, I'm very interested in is in microaggressions. Mm. You know, these small triggers that show you that you don't belong when you talk about other, but those are tiny. You know, when people, uh, you know, make a joke or where for, for you know how you talk or something related to you but they expect you to laugh things like that yeah. and there is a lot about uh, you know how allies can help with micro inclusions but what I'm very interested in is how to handle that you know moment where you you know that person you feel threatened is mm -hmm. small but you uh, have seen the pattern because this is what a microaggression is mm -hmm. so if you you know uh, have uh, you know any ideas in that in that moment you know um, uh, what the person can do you know to ease um, absolutely this. so unless it's overt uh, racism, I would begin with, uh, or, or sexism or homophobia or any of those, I would begin always with unconditional positive regard. I would assume that they are trying to be their best person in the moment and they are not aware of the impact that they're having. So that would then shape the way that I chose to speak to them and how I chose to frame the problem. If I'm able to hold them in my, in my head, in my heart as a good person and feel warmth and support and empathy and compassion for them, it means I'm less likely to be aggressive when I do bring that up with them. And then I would probably go in with something like, I'm sure this is not what you're trying to do, but this is the effect that it's having on me. And I'm trying to manage my own emotions in that situation, but I also wanted to make you aware in case it's something that you wouldn't want to be doing. 
um, and would like, you know, maybe we can have a conversation about how that's impacting me and how that might impact other people. Uh, I would love to help you so that, you know, people continue to think well of you because I care about you and I want people to think well of you uh, and I want to support you in that um, and I, you know I'm not doing this to be unkind or uh, I don't think you're a bad person um, but yeah help me to help you through this please okay very interesting Thank how does very that much. sound to you I'm, I'm curious um I th I think to be honest that that puts the burden on the person that has been Microaggressed, mm -hmm. and I think that I understand where you come from, and I think that it is, you know, theoretically is very good. And if it happens once, or especially, you know, I think this happen that is useful when it's somebody from a friend or or a family. You know, you can always have this old uncle, you know, or somebody that, you know, maybe is doing this remark and, and you don't, you take it this way. Yeah. In the workplace, I, um, I, I have to think, you know, more what you said before to put your mask, you know, and, you know, that can be somebody that, work, you know, it's, it's, that has that layer of complexity. Sorry, I have a I have a ten year old. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I absolutely it's harder when uh, harder when we're at work. I think one of the risks that we run uh, when we bring these things to people is that instantly they feel criticised, they feel attacked, and in that moment we've lost the conversation and we can't take it anywhere. Whenever we have a disagreement with somebody, essentially what we're trying to work towards, we stand on one side of a, a chasm, they stand on the other, and we're trying to build a bridge across to the other side. Now, they're not, there you go, I have another, there's, there's three of them in total, so they're all joining now. Um, in that moment, they don't necessarily know that there's a chasm. As far as they're concerned, as far as they're aware, you're standing on the same side they're not even aware that there's a bridge so I think you know the responsibility has to lie on the person that's uh, experiencing the hurt experiencing the aggression simply in terms of making the other person aware and not because they owe it to the other person not because they owe it to anyone else but more more because they well, because they owe it to themselves, you know, they're going to end up in a, a, a more sustainable, uh, better position in the long term and have a better relationship with that person, be more likely to get them on board and empathetic towards their feelings. And it's it sucks, right? It shouldn't be placed, the owners shouldn't be placed on them. It's not fair. But I think we always have to operate from where we are, not where we would like to be. And in an ideal world, everybody would spot and understand and see when they were being aggressive and unpleasant and un unnecessary. But unfortunately, they don't. So we can either exist in that world and experience it and feel crap about it, or we can take the conversation to them in a way that means that they stand some chance of being able to hear it. And that's hard, but I don't have a better suggestion. OK, thank you very much. Thanks for your question. Um, Michael, am I saying your name right? Yes, it's in German because I'm German, it's Michael, but Michael. that's not uh, that important at the moment. My question is more uh, the, um, uh, is the situation for uh, persons or people with ADHD um, the same or are they slightly or uh, more different. <laughs> well, I have ADHD uh, and um, I think as with everything, it's all about perspective. I think uh, ADHD means that we end up with uh, a number of uh, different ways of seeing the world, different ways of experiencing the world and different ways of interacting with it. Um, I think it can be really hard to learn what those ways are. Um, and how we need to respond with the world as a result. But certainly um, I've found the impulsivity can be uh, particularly unhelpful. 
Um, and so, I, you know, that's one of the reasons that I do the job that I do is because of struggling with all of these things and also helping my children with exactly the same struggles. Um, and this is where, you know, things like mindfulness um, and appreciating the world as it is, not as we would like it to be, can be really helpful when we are sat in this cycle of um, you know, responding to things that we think should be happening, things that we should be doing. Uh, it's really easy for us then to give ourselves a hard time and to berate ourselves and beat ourselves down and to knock our confidence um, and we can really go into a, a really painful and destructive downhill spiral. I think actually moving to a position where we're accepting what is and deciding what we can do about that moving forwards is a much more empowering position to be uh, to be starting from with any kind of neurodiversity. I think any anything can be worked with if we understand what it is, how it shows up, how it impacts us and how it means that we react to the world around us. Um, that's always our starting point. Thank you for your question. Did that answer? Yeah, thank you too. These are great questions. <laughs> thank you so much. 